Recognized. Mr. President, uh, very shortly, we will be voting on the amendment filed by my colleague from uh, Missouri, Senator Blunt, the Respect for Rights of Conscience Act. I'm a co-sponsor of this amendment, and I think we ought to all be co-sponsors of it. Many of my colleagues have supported it as well, and for good reason. It provides statutory protection for one of our deepest constitutional commitments, the right to free exercise of religion. It is an effort to fulfill our oath to protect and defend the Constitution. It is an effort to put the enduring constitutional rights of the American people first over any fleeting and controversial political interests. In my view, those who support this amendment have been unjustly criticized over the past few days. And they've been unjustly criticized on a political basis, not really on an intellectual basis. Unable to win this debate through a fair criticism of the amendment, it has been mischaracterized and misrepresented. Opponents are desperate to distract the public from one simple fact. This amendment is necessary because of Obamacare, the health care law that manifests new threats to personal liberty and individual rights with each passing week. It is an indictment of the President's signature domestic achievement and all of those who supported it. Obamacare took over and regulated the nation's health care sector, one-sixth of the American economy. It stripped individuals and employers of their rights to go without coverage and the right to determine what type of coverage they would have. Obamacare is what has brought us here today. The health care law requires that women's preventive services, including sterilization and access to abortion-inducing drugs, be included in health care coverage beginning in 2012. This is a questionable policy in and of itself. Like the rest of Obamacare, it assumes that the government is able to provide all good things to the American people through a simple mandate with no consequences for cost or, ex or access. The problems with this uh, mandate were compounded, however, when the administration, deferring to its feminist allies, determined that the mandate would apply to religious citizens and institutions. To their credit, these institutions, which are compelled by this regulation to violate their moral beliefs, announced that they would not comply with this unjust law. They refused to roll over and allow the government to force them to provide sterilizations and abortion-inducing drugs to their employees. Religions should have a right to do that because of their own moral interpretations of religious life. They stood as a witness for constitutional liberty, the free exercise of religion, and against an administration that put base partisan politics above our beloved Constitution. The President's self-proclaimed compromise does absolutely nothing to minimize the constitutional problems with this mandate. The Department of Health and Human Services never never consulted with the Department of Justice about the constitutionality of this mandate. And it shows, and that's why we're here today, to undo just some of the damage to liberty and our Constitution wrought by Obamacare. All of the misleading arguments regarding this amendment run square into one simple fact. Obamacare only became law in 2010. There was no federal mandate for these services prior to 2010. And the regulations had not yet gone into effect. In other words, nobody is taking anything away from anybody. But to hear the other side talk, you would think that the co-sponsors of this amendment and the groups that support it are committed to a monstrous deprivation of women's rights. With due respect, that is absolute hogwash. I appreciate that the advocates of Obamacare might be embarrassed by this episode, but we are not going to let them get away with a gross misrepresentation of what we are trying to do here. Prior to 2010 and the partisan passage of Obamacare, access to contraceptives was abundant, and nobody advocated that the federal government involve itself in those personal moral decisions or force people to be involved. Religious people, if you will. 
After 2010, access to contraceptives remained abundant, with nobody advocating for restrictions on their access. Here's all that changed in the meantime. In 2010, Obama, Obamacare mandated that health coverage include sterilizations, abortion-inducing drugs, and contraceptive coverage. And as a result, religious institutions and persons will now be compelled by the state to violate their conscience. Compelled by the federal government to violate their conscience. And it isn't just the Catholic Church. It's many, many churches that feel just the same way as the Catholic Church does. It's a moral and religious issue that should not be interfered with by the federal government. Prior to, two, prior to 2010 and the passage of Obamacare, the First Amendment was intact. Today, the First Amendment is in tatters. The Democrats who passed this law know this to be true, and they have to distract and confuse. They claim that Senator Blunt's amendment is overbroad. They claim that religious institutions and individuals would be exempt or would exempt critical health services such as blood transfusions and psychiatric care from health plans. The Senate Democratic Steering Committee claims that 20.4 million women now receiving coverage for preventive services would lose that coverage under this amendment. Absolutely nothing Absolutely none of this is accurate. Again, all this amendment does is restore the pre-Obamacare status quo. All it does is restore the religious liberties and constitutional freedoms that existed prior to this government takeover of our nation's health care system. It restores the conscience protections that existed for all Americans for the past 220 years. If this amendment passes, here are a few things that do not change. State mandates for health coverage will remain in place. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, forbidding discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in employment benefits, remains in place. The Pregnancy Discrimination Act, requiring health plans to cover pregnancy, childbirth and related conditions remains in place. The Americans with Disabilities Act, a bill that I worked very hard to pass and was a prime sponsor of, prohibiting discriminatory withholding of health care and other benefits from people with HIV or other disabilities remains in place. And the Mental Health Parity Act of 2008 requiring equitable coverage of mental illness remains in place. I played a role in every one of those. Prior to Obamacare, very few people excluded any of the services that Democrats are pointing at in their efforts to scare the American people. And few will do so should the Blunt Amendment pass. But our Constitution demands that those individuals and institutions that object to providing these services on religious and moral grounds be protected. That's what the Constitution demands. It's the First Amendment. It's the first mention in the First Amendment. Even though the individuals and institutions protected by our amendment are a minority, it is that minority that our First Amendment exists to protect. The rule agreed to by President Obama would force religious organizations to violate their moral convictions. Now, this cannot be allowed to stand. I call on my colleagues on the other side to wake up and realize what they're doing here. There's only so much politics that should be played around here. And this is an issue we shouldn't be playing politics on. It involves religious freedom and liberty. And there was a time when a regulation of this sort would not have been countenanced by this body, let alone some of the arguments that have been made on the other side, trying to obscure it and make a political thing out of this. I've had the good fortune of representing the people of Utah for many, many years. It has been an honor for me. And, it, and in that time, I have seen many good people on both sides of the aisle serve well in the Senate. And one thing we could always be sure of was that when it came to our first freedoms, in particular the freedom to practice one's religion, without interference from the state, Republicans and Democrats would join together 
in the defense of religious rights and liberty. Why are we not joining together here? Yet under this administration, our Bill of Rights has been subordinated to President Obama's desire to micromanage the nation's health care system. It was not always this way. When the Senate considered President Clinton's health care law, itself an attempt at a sweeping takeover of the nation's health care system, giants like Daniel Patrick Moynihan, with whom I've served, a Democrat and colleague who served as the chairman of the Finance Committee, stood up for broad conscience, conscience protections like the one we're considering today in the Blood Amendment. I worked closely with many of my Democratic colleagues in passing the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I was the author of that bill. We passed it here. It overwhelmingly passed. I was there when President Clinton signed it into law on the lawn behind the White House. And a lot of religious leaders were there, and a lot of liberals and conservatives were there. Very happy to pass that law. But apparently those days of bipartisanship are laid to rest, and they're long past. Today the administration ignores the dear and clear dictates of the First Amendment and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Obamacare is unconstitutional to its core, a threat to the liberties announced and protected by our Declaration of Independence. This mandate is just one more example of how the law restricts personal liberty. It will force religious persons and institutions to violate their beliefs or pay a fine. Defending this disaster at a town hall meeting recently, one Democratic member of the House of Representatives told her constituents that they were, quote, not looking into the Constitution, unquote, when they supported this mandate. No kidding. Our founding fathers fought a revolution to prevent this type of tyranny. And that's what it is. This is tyranny. It is the political bullying of a religious group in the views of the President's allies unpopular religious beliefs. And so for, the, for political reasons, the religious groups who differ with this are being pushed around. The media, polite society, and the administration are picking on religious freedom and on religious people. Democrats like to claim that they stand up for the little guy. Not in this case. In this case, the little guy is being pushed around by the state. And I, for one, am not going to stand for it. This is discrimination masquerading as compassion, and I'm going to fight it. My oath of office, an oath to protect the Constitution, compels me to do this. I am putting the administration on notice. I'm not done with you, and my colleagues are not done with you. Whatever happens with this vote today, you are going to be held to account for your actions. We're going to get to the bottom of how this happened, and ultimately, I am confident that justice will prevail. I just hope enough of my colleagues realize how important this is. It's a fundamental set of freedoms that we've always protected. And nobody was being deprived of the so-called health care that, that is involved here. And ultimately, I am confident that justice will prevail. I commend my colleague from Missouri and all of the members who have spoken out for this amendment. It is reasonable. It is just. And I urge all of my colleagues to vote for it. The American people understand that this amendment is necessary because of Obamacare, and they know who is responsible for this monstrosity. I expect that they will look favorably on those who stand up for the First Amendment today and attempt to correct their folly by restoring the conscience protections that preexisted Obamacare. And the reaction to those who stand by this historic deprivation of First Amendment rights, only time's going to tell. Let me close by just saying there are very few things that get me worked up as much as I am about this. I feel very deeply about a lot of things, but that First Amendment to me means everything. And for the President to say, well, we'll just require the insurance companies to provide this. Give me a break. A lot of the, the, Catholic, ins the Catholic functions are, ins are self-insured. 
by the Catholic Church. And that's true of other churches as well. The fact of the matter is, it's no solution whatsoever. And it was something that didn't need this type of intrusion because people had access to these various uh, drugs that, uh, uh, that some are concerned about here today. And nobody on our side, it seems to me, fails to realize that religious commitment is important. Religious beliefs are important. The First Amendment is important. The free exercise of religion is important. That's what's involved here. My gosh, to hear these arguments that this is all about contraception, my gosh, that's not what it's about. It's about the right of people with religious beliefs to practice their religion unmolested by government. I want to commend the distinguished senator from Missouri. You know, it takes guts to stand up on these issues when they're so distorted by some on the other side. I'd be ashamed to make some of the arguments that were made on this issue. Why do you think, uh, and I just single out the Catholic Church, which is the largest congregation in our country. They're not going to abide by these laws because their religious beliefs are more important than what we want to impose on them, ignoring their religious freedoms. I'm 100% with them. When we start going down this road, let me tell you, beware, beware. That's when tyranny really begins. It's the religious commitments of our nation that has made it the greatest nation in the world. And I've got to tell you, those of you who vote against this amendment are playing with fire. Those of you who vote against this amendment are ignoring the Constitution. Those of you who vote against this amendment are wrong. Mr. President.